A woman's hand turns a globe. Worldwide access. It's not a revolution anymore. Everybody's going online, like students. There's so much information on it, it's unbelievable. Small business owners like this soap making company. Subtitles for Lacey, a small business owner, read We're hoping to make our own website. And people with international connections. Ollie. I think I was the first person from my family to go on the internet. Yeah, I, and then I got a website from my country. Uh, you know, and uh, I was you know, amazed. I said, oh, they have even this stuff in here. Electronic resources allow us to pursue careers, research, and friendships as never before. And this includes people with disabilities. Annette, library visitor. It's very important that one becomes um, literate in the World Wide Web and um, the Internet. Matt Sines. The experiences that I have have been really wonderful, and the technology is just out, you know, just really out of this world. Wesley. The aspect of computers that I really like is this whole Internet bit. It opens so many doors. In many cases, people with disabilities need assistive technology in order to access all this information. For example, screen images can be enlarged for people who have low vision. Or a speech output system can read the computer screen for those who are blind. Welcome, Spotlight. Alternative keyboards are available for people who can't use a standard keyboard. This technology is used at home, at work, and in schools and libraries. Cleo Kelly. What the libraries seek to do is provide independent access for everyone. And no one wants to have to make arrangements with their mother to bring them to the library when they're a 38-year-old individual. The accessible equipment makes access independent access. I want to underscore that. Possible. To accomplish this, the information itself needs to be created in an accessible format. For example, the World Wide Web can sometimes be a confusing landscape for people with disabilities, even when they're using assistive technology. Access to websites, it's a mass of information out there that everyone can benefit from. And the internet and websites should be information access without walls, without barriers. Typically, people design products for the average user. The principle of universal design means making design decisions based on the diversity of potential users, including people of different ages, people for whom English is a second language, and people with disabilities. Cliff. Web pages work well as long as the designer thinks about how I can read it. For instance, my screen reader can't read graphics. In presenting your website information, an important thing to remember is that people will be accessing that information in different ways and you want to be sure that they can understand and use all of it. For example, people with visual impairments often use screen readers with their computers. The screen reader can only read text, not graphics or pictures. Dean. If there's pictures, I can't tell what's going on. I, if the speech system will read image, 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 or uh, link, 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 without having any kind of text to tell me what these are, I don't know if there's something useful there or there isn't something useful there. If you are creating a web page using graphics or pictures, include descriptive text with those images. This written description will then be available to anyone who can't see the graphics. Stephanie. A lot of times people don't describe pictures. That would be a good thing to um, do when you're thinking of designing a web page. Um, also make sure everything you want people to get to, make sure it's a clear link so that when I use my shortcut keys to get to the links, I know exactly what it is. Unlabeled graphics can create barriers for people using screen readers. So can poorly worded text links, inappropriately titled frames, and poorly designed tables. And since some visitors might be colorblind, be sure to use navigation choices that don't rely on color alone. Keep backgrounds simple and make sure there's enough contrast between your background and your text. Annette. Contrast is very important. There's a difference between the, you know, the foreground and the background. That's very important. Sarah. Sometimes they have, like, neon greens and stuff that are really difficult to read just in general. Sometimes there's sites that have, especially with, like, advertisements, that have the blinking on and off and on and off, and, and it changes words or whatever, and that's really hard to read. 
Blinking text or images can also trigger seizures in some susceptible individuals. Avoid the gimmicks trap. Don't sacrifice content for flash. Rick, you have to figure out what task a person is trying to do when they come to your website. And then you try to design the page to make it easy for them to easily, effectively, properly do the task correctly the first time. For deaf visitors, any auditory information should also be readable in text. For example, lyrics or speeches should be transcribed. Ever get a green potato chip in your bag of chips? Why are they green? If you're including videos, make sure to caption them. Captioning can be done during a production, or it can be added when the material is being converted to a format for publishing on your site. Without captioning or transcriptions, deaf visitors will not have access to any audio you may include. Matt Sines. When I'm going into a website, it'll go right past me if it happens like there's music or talking and there's no captioning there. I just get lost and then I'll have to ask my friend, would you tell me what that says? And then I, I really feel lost. It also helps to design pages that can be accessed with either the keyboard or the mouse alone, since some people can't use one or the other. Sarah. I use a small trackball mouse that is lightweight so I can hold it without too much trouble in my hand. And it has a, the ball on the top of it because I can't reach the table to move it around on the table. So I can hold it in the air and have it right by me. Another essential point is to keep your overall design simple and clean. This is important for people who have visual impairments, as well as for those with learning disabilities, or for whom English is a second language. Rick. You shouldn't think of accessible design as an extra burden being added on top of it. What's really, in my experience, happening is you're discovering all these wonderful features that are built into the technology from the beginning, and use, learning how to use them so that they really uh, work for your audience. Michael. I think everybody would like a simple web page. It's a lot more, a lot, a lot less complicated and a lot less cluttered. It just looks a lot better. It's definitely easier for everyone when you use a simple, standard layout. Buttons and navigational links should appear in the same place on all pages. Headers should have the same format. Simplicity can help you reach your goal, which is... Chris. To get as much information as you can across with your page, rather than to be the, the coolest page on the web. To design accessible websites and other electronic resources, Consider a wide variety of users. Imagine being blind or deaf or having difficulty using your hands. What if you had trouble reading because of your age or a learning disability or because you weren't familiar with English? Apply guidelines to make your site accessible. You can find information and examples on the web, including the federal government's list of standards at www.section508.gov. Then, test your web pages with a variety of browsers. Try those browsers with the graphics loading feature turned off. Try accessing your site with the keyboard alone. And test your design with people who have a wide variety of characteristics. Rick. There's a whole area of study called usability studies, where you put people in front of your website, you give them tasks to do, and, and then they tell you what it's like to try to do that task. So. What we're learning to do is extend that usability testing process to people who are approaching our web pages with um, uh, adaptive technologies, with um, personal data assistance, with cell phones, and so on. We're trying to find out what the experience is to interact with our information, whoever you are. Providing access to information resources, including web pages, is required by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Guidelines and resources are abundant. There are tools that will test your site for accessibility. Some of those tools are even built into standard products. Rick. The web publishing programs have built-in features. We've got good tutorials. We've got excellent, clear guidelines. The methods are clearly documented. So why not? Let's do it. For more information about accessible web design, consult the technology area of the DOIT website at www.washington.edu slash DOIT. Phone, voice or TTY, 206-685-DOIT. Or DOIT, University of Washington, Box 355670, Seattle, Washington, 
9815-5670. Director Cheryl Bergstaller. Funding for this video was provided by the Telecommunications Funding Partnership, the National Science Foundation, and the U.S. Department of Education. The opinions expressed in this video are not necessarily those of the funding sources. Additional resources were provided by the Seattle Public Library. Copyright 2002, University of Washington. Additional narration by the Narrative Television Network.